morning, everybody. I'm here at Camp Nerd Fitness, and I'm teaching a class this morning. So normally on Periscope, I can answer your questions, but I can't. I'm going to answer these people's questions, because they paid good money to be here. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to talk about today, I wonder if this works. Maybe, maybe you can just double check that I'm in shot. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so welcome, everybody, and thank you for waking up early. Um, oh, you know what? I had a mic. Maybe you can poke that in, and Side it'll here. help. Thank you for the hearts. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is making dinner when you don't want to make dinner. I have those days all the time. Like, people ask me, like, what's your favorite dish that you like to make? And I always answer something that someone else makes me, because <laughs> I love to eat more than I love to cook. But because I'm so... Hmm, I don't want to use the word picky. I think because I'm so discerning, <laughs> I um, I want it to taste good. And so I think when I went paleo, like so before I went paleo, you know, I did the whole you know healthy whole grains, and I felt terrible, and I was mostly vegetarian. Um, and then I found paleo, and I was like, oh, I feel so much better. But now I have to cook all the time, and it's a lot harder than just throwing um, you know some pasta into a pot. Um, or grabbing a bowl of like grape nuts or something gross like that, but or garden burger like those are all like my standbys for like quick meals. And so when I turn paleo, I'm like, hmm, what are some desperation dinners that I can do that'll still taste great and I can throw them together at a moment's notice? And so I'm going to demonstrate three today. But um, I know you guys all like to take notes because you're all nerds because I'm also a nerd. Um, but I have a podcast that is all about desperation dinners. Um, so if you don't know, I do have a podcast. We aren't very regular <laughs> about doing it. I think at first when we started the podcast, we're like, we're going to do it every week. And then Henry, who does the editing, my husband, was like, we are not doing it every week because this is way too much work for me and I have a real job. I'm like, okay, I don't want you to die. We will do it whenever they come out. So I think we're currently editing one, and it should be out next week, but it's maybe once every month. But we have like 14, and we've tried to kind of um, put kind of the most, I guess the most hopefully useful information. So we have one on desperation dinners. We have one on umami, because I think that is, um, you know, it's the fifth taste, and, and I'll be incorporating that in these dishes, and I'll, I'll talk about that as well. But knowing which ingredients add umami, um, and that will just boost the flavor of your food um, without too much effort. And so on the Desperation Dinners podcast, and I also have all the show notes, so again, you don't have to take any notes, because everything on the podcast, all the recipes are linked. I have more recipes than what I'm going to be doing today. Um, I have like five to ten minute no-cook meals. I even have a post on like ten of my favorite no-cook paleo meals. So no excuses. Like you can get food on the table. Um, and then I also have things that you can cook really quickly, like my garbage stir fry. And people are always like, ew, gross. I can't believe you call it garbage stir fry. But I like that name. So I'm going to keep using it. Um, but basically, it just means that I'm cleaning out my fridge. So people like to call it cleaning out your fridge dinner. And what I try to do to ensure that I have, um, so all it is is it's stir fry with protein and vegetables and some sort of seasoning. Pretty simple, right? Um, the only thing you need to do then is make sure you have some meat and protein. And so one thing I always have in my fridge is ground meat. Like ground meat is cheap. Like people are always talking about how paleo is expensive and it, it is. Like there's no way around it if you want higher quality food, it's going to be cheaper than highly subsidized grain products. Um, but you can make it workable because like ground beef um, and ground meat is normally um, pretty affordable. Costco has like organic ground meat. Um, I know in the frozen section at Trader Joe's, see I'm all about bargains. <laughs> I know in the frozen section of Trader Joe's they have, you know, 100% grass fed beef, which I think is around $4.99 a pound. Um, and you can make it stretch. So I know that sometimes you'll go into like a butcher shop and ground beef there is like $10 a pound, but you can totally get it for cheaper. You can invest in a whole cow and then you get tons of ground beef with that because you know, whatever isn't you know, made into chops or brisket or the main um, cuts, they just go 
grind up. Um, and so I will show that. Oh, and the next, I'm going to show you how to make mayo, and hopefully it'll work because I don't have my um, normal little immersion blender. Um, but I do have a periscope where I tell you exactly how I do it at home <laughs> if you use my blender. But I think it'll work, and I'll sh and hopefully it'll work. I have the same blender. It'll work. This one? Awesome. Yeah. And then do you use it I in one of these? I use like a little glass jar. Yeah, yeah See, so I it does. I have a problem if it's the wrong like, size. It's the wrong size. Yeah, yeah. It, it needs to be narrow enough so that you emulsify right away. Yeah. Because exactly. that is the trick. Yeah. yeah, that might be. Like, it might. I think if, if we, I, I, I will. Mason jars, yeah. If you use a little mason jar, you can just pour it on Yes, that I is use. perfect. That's and I true. think I have a Cuisinart um, blender, so the head is actually bigger, and it doesn't fit in a normal mason jar. You have to get the wide. Yeah, the wide mouth. Yeah, the yeah. Jars, yeah. yeah the short one. But this one I, I think might fit because this is actually a pretty narrow one. Um, so mayo is wonderful, but even if you don't make your own mayo, because I know that um, mayo can be kind of finicky. Um, you can buy pretty good mayo these days. Um, like Mark Sisson has Primal Kitchen Mayo, which is pretty tasty. It's made with like avocado oil. Um, I think Mr. Kensington's is pretty good. It's, I think they use sunflower seed oil, which I think is fine. Um, I think a lot of people obsess about, you know, whether or not like an omega-6 and omega-3 ratio is okay, but I think it's, I think it's okay. Um, and I think those two are pretty good. I know, I'm trying to think if there are other brands. But it's not like you use that much mayo anyway, but it's a good thing to have in your fridge for desperation minutes. And so I will show you how you can use that to make a really quick and flavorful chicken salad. <coughs> so I will just start. So this. Before um, you start, how do you get to your podcast? Oh, so um, on iTunes, like I guess iTunes, or the, yeah. Um, Stitcher, whatever, wherever you listen to podcasts, and then if you just go to my site, um, I think if you go to Podcast Archive, it's one of the um, little things in the menu. Um, when you click on the show notes, it should have, I also have it embedded, so you can always just listen to it directly. And your site is? Nom Nom Paleo. Um, so I'm going to... <laughs> See, I'm not quite nerdy enough to figure out how to turn this on. It's on medium. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just keep this on because the thing with cast iron, cast iron is my favorite. Oh, I may need a. Perfect. Uh, I was about to ask if you yes. wanted a. Uh... Yes, something like a. Oh. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> so cast, cast iron is 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 my favorite um, cooking skillet material. Um, I used to spend a lot more money on like you know fancier glad stuff, but these days I use um, cast iron probably exclusively because I've used it so much that it's really, really well seasoned and um, I can fry an egg in it and it will slip out perfectly. And people are like, how do you get it to be like that? And it's kind of a catch-22. You really do, like you can buy the pre-seasoned cast iron skillets, but they're not that good. Like it, it's not well seasoned enough. And so you just have to keep using it. And the first few times you use it, it's going to stick. And you can't give up. You've got to be persistent and keep using it and be OK with it being a little dirty. <laughs> like, you know, people like scrub it crazy clean. But you don't really have to do it that clean. But there's actually, and if you want to learn all about cast iron and cast iron skillets and how to um, like treat it properly, um, if you go, yeah, this you might want to take notes because I'm not sure I have it on my, oh, I, I think I did. I think I update all my stuff with the, my newest stuff. So if you look on my site, I have a post on how to season cast iron skillets with coconut oil because that's what I normally use or I use ghee. But if you go to Serious Eats and just Google um, cast iron Serious Eats um, or like J. Kenji Lopez Alt or the Food Lab and cast iron skillet, um, he did this really, really amazing post about debunking cast iron skillet myths. Like, there's a myth that you can never use soap. He's like, no, you can use soap. You just need to um, make sure that you season, like you put some oil in the pan. Um, and then he's saying how, he said it's another myth that your cast iron skillet heats evenly, and it doesn't. Um, and so that's why you actually have to rotate your pans. The clad, um, like the all clad and all the ones that have like clad metal, that does um, heat evenly. But the thing about cast iron is it retains heat really, really well. 
but it takes a while to get hot. So this I've been heating up for a while because I know it takes a little while to get hot. Um, but it'll retain really well. So when you fry in something like this, like normally if you're frying like chicken, um, like if you're making cracking chicken, it's perfect in a cast iron skillet because when you add the cold chicken, it doesn't decrease the temperature of the pan that quickly. Like it retains the heat and that's why you get this really great crisp sear. And that's why searing like steaks and chicken in a cast iron skillet is perfect. Oh, thank you. Oh, and when you use like um, some sort of towel, oh, people are asking me questions. I've seen her cook so many times. <laughs> um, and so you, if you're using a towel as um, your hot, hot, yes, yes, as your <laughs> pot holder, make sure it's not wet because then, you know, as nerds, we know that conducts heat and you will burn your hands. <laughs> um, so this is how I make uh, my garbage stir fry. I look in my fridge and I'm like, look, someone has already diced this cabbage for me, which is probably not true. <laughs> <laughs> but dicing a cabbage is really fast. You can do this ahead of time on the weekend when you do have time. You can prep a lot of vegetables. Most of the time, if you pre-cut and um, store things, if it's in an airtight container, it's probably good for four days at least. Um, and you can have one day where you're just in front of your food processor and, and just putting it through the slicer. <laughs> like, um, another thing that I do is I, I buy, um, I know you're always just supposed to shop at the farmer's market, but I do buy like those bags of organic baby kale, like at Costco, um, because you can just, that is like a quick stir fry um, that you can throw in. So it's like instant vegetables, you can do, um, baby spinach is also just like that. It's super quick um, cooking. I have a lot of frozen <coughs> mixed vegetables because that can go straight from the freezer into your pan. You don't have to wash or cut anything because, as everybody knows, paleo is not about just eating meat. Um, it's really important to eat vegetables. If anything, I don't think my meat, well, I guess from when I was a semi-vegetarian, my meat consumption has increased, but um, in terms of um, I think if you were to look at my plate now, the amount of protein is probably the size of my palm or my hand, but the quality of that I make sure is much better than it used to be. Before I'd be like, oh, I'm just gonna buy the boneless, skinless chicken breast that's in bulk, um, but now I try to you know, source better uh, protein. But then the rest of my plate, instead of being a giant thing of whole grain pasta <laughs> or some other carby thing, which I used to do, is vegetables of some kind. So I will have salad or stir fry. I have some sort of starchy vegetable. Like I do eat potatoes, like a lot of paleo folks. I think paleo 1.0 said that potatoes aren't okay, but I totally think potatoes are okay if you tolerate it. I think um, a lot of people are um, always kind of obsessed with like what's paleo and what's not paleo and the yes and no's. Um, and I think that's really important when you start. Like just because you kind of, that way, you kind of have an idea of what um, you should be eating and what you shouldn't be eating. But once you do like a 30 day reset, then you should just see what works for you because everybody's different. Um, like I can eat white rice. I don't, but the difference now is I probably used to have this giant thing of white rice um, because you know, meat is bad and carbs are good <laughs> and fat is bad. <laughs> Um, but now, like, I, again, I will have, like, my palm-sized meat and mostly vegetables and, like, a little thing of rice. And, like, I savor that rice, and I'll leave the rice for the end. Um, and I wait till I'm kind of full from all the other stuff. Um, but I know for me, when I went super, super low-carb, um, I just didn't feel really great. Um, so rice, I think, works for me, and I think my genetics, because my people have been eating rice for many, many years, <laughs> that it works, it works for me. So um, that was me stalling to make sure this was hot enough. Oh, yeah, this is really hot. So I just put in, um, I'm assuming this is olive oil. Yep. Okay. So you can use olive oil, I think, for a while. I normally cook with ghee. Um, that's probably my favorite high temperature cooking fat. Um, I don't know if this needs, I think that's good. Um, I also use coconut oil for a while, I think. When I first started paleo five years ago, it was all about coconut, and I did coconut everything, and I cooked with coconut oil, but I don't use coconut oil as much anymore. I think it's still a great cooking fat, um, but sometimes the flavor is a little overpowering. Um, and I think initially people used to say you can't cook with olive oil because um, 
you know, with high temperature cooking, it can break down. But I think recently there have been all of these articles, and there's one on Series Eats, which is probably one of my favorite, like, food nerd related sites where they said, no, it's actually okay if you cook with um, olive oil. So I'm going to use some olive oil here. And you always want to have, make sure your pan is nice and hot. Not super, super hot so that, oh, well, it is steaming. <laughs>
feel yourself the right way, you won't set yourself up um, to fail. And if you just have leftovers, like I always have left, whatever I cook, I always make extra, and I save every little scrap of it. Like let's say like our family eats this and there's like only like a little bit left, I can add that to a frittata. Like there's, and you can bulk it up with eggs. Um, there's just so many things. Like you can have a little thing of this garbage stir fry that you can use and get some frozen vegetables from the freezer. And you know, so you can easily bulk it up. And you know, sometimes um, I do eat carbs. And so if I don't have like some cooked and cold rice in the sweet fridge, like I'll have some plantain chips. <laughs> because those are really yummy. Um, and so this year I'm just breaking up with um, this wooden spatula. And again, I'm gonna salt this. And again, you, you probably are under salting stuff. Um, and my favorite cooking salt is diamond crystal kosher salt because um, diamond crystal kosher salt and if you feel, this, this I can tell is diamond crystal kosher salt. I can tell by feel. And um, a, lot of, a lot of chefs, when they're training new cooks in the kitchen, will make them season with diamond crystals. Um, because, and I'm not a chef, but I read this somewhere. <laughs> and they said it's because these crystals are bigger that it's hard to over season. Um, and by touch, you can feel like how, how much you're adding. So this is my favorite salt. A lot of times when you're using like really fine sea salt, um, it's hard to get a feel of how much you're adding. And you don't need a ton of oil because um, I always try to get meat that's like 20% fat. Um, and so then the fat should be rendering out. And depending on what you have, so I'm going to season this um, kind of like an Indian kind of keema type of um, garbage stir fry. And so I have some Madras uh, curry powder. But a lot of times, I'll just ask the kids, I'm like, you're going to have garbage stir fry tonight. There's no choice. <laughs> but you do have a choice in how you want it flavored. So I can make it kind of Italian flavored, like I can add... Um, some tomato paste because that adds a lot of umami when I'm um, sauteing the onions. And then I'll add some, you know, jarred marinara sauce because there are a lot of them that I really like and that way you can instantly flavor it. Um, and then um, sometimes I'll make it Asian flavored. I'll use like uh, thinly sliced bok choy and then I will season it with some fish sauce and coconut aminos and then I normally add a little bit of like rice wine vinegar or something to kind of bring up the flavor. Like this, I have some lime juice. Because I really think that finishing with an acid really helps um, make things taste better and it brightens the flavor. So this is pretty easy. I, I do feel like I need to add more salt. And I'll, I'll taste it. <laughs> and so once it's no longer pink, And this cabbage shouldn't take too long to cook. This pan is a little bit, I think, a little bit small for um, all this cabbage. And so I would recommend if you're doing two pounds, use the 12 inch. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of like how much curry powder to add, it really is to taste. Um, I do have a measurement on my, um, on my recipe on my site. So you can follow that exactly. Um, because every recipe on my site has been tested many, many times because if I don't test them properly, um, I hear about it right away. And I think before when I was like just posting stuff for myself, I'd be like, ah, whatever, and I'd put something up. And especially when I was working nights and I was doing um, non mom paleo, I was like, okay, this is what we had for dinner, let me quickly put up the recipe. And then I'd start getting comments like, I tried this, and you know, this was too salty. I'm like, oh, I put in the wrong amount. <laughs> And so I get instant feedback. So most everything, everything on the site, um, I have tested many times because I hear about stuff right away. It doesn't work. Okay. Yeah, see, that smells really good. And I think the Madras, Madras um, curry powder is one of my favorites because it's
it's a very mild one because I think a lot of times we're like, I don't like curry. Um, it's too spicy or it's too crazy. But Madras is a very, um, I think it's very mild. It's a really nice kind of beginner curry powder. And then once you go beyond that, you can start exploring. Uh, how is Madras spelled? M-A-D-R-A-S. And the brand I like, there's a, if you go to the grocery store, there's like a tin and it has like a little sun on it. But I think any place, like if you walk into a spice shop, like, you know, Penzi's or any spice shop, just go in and almost all those places, you can smell all of their seasoning blends. And like, you know how this smells? Like if you smell like, oh, that smells good, then just try it. And it's like, Having a bunch of seasoning blends on hand makes things so much easier. Because if you just season this with salt and pepper, it's really going to be bland and boring. Um, but just by adding some curry powder and then some lime juice at the end, it really does amp it up. And I'm going to add, I'm not going to add all of it, because I think um, <laughs> I can add all of it. Um, but again, every step, season it a little bit. And you don't have to like dump it all. Don't dump all of your salt in. Just slowly mm -hmm. feed in. And you would be surprised, I think. Well, that every step the salt? Yes. And then afterwards, um, you can taste it. And if you want more curry powder, you can add more curry powder. But this is how I just do kind of a simple Indian garbage stir fry. Um, I have to tell the truth, and this is not my kid's favorite. They're okay with the curry part, they just hate cabbage. And I don't know why I love cabbage, and I think I, 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 and I've been trying to, and so actually this is another trick I do, especially with vegetables that cook down, um, is you just keep adding it because they will start, um, you know, wilting. And especially with a giant bag of kale, um, like the baby kale, you can totally fit in like a ton of vegetables. Um, and as I said before, if you don't want to slice and dice, just keep frozen vegetables and you would throw them in at this point. And if I throw them in frozen and then I put a lid on top and you won't overcook <coughs> anything. Well, you can, you can't overcook the vegetables, <laughs> but it's okay. Cause like with frozen vegetables, you know they're gonna be a little soft anyway, and it's okay. This is a desperation dinner. You're not serving this to your future in-laws. <laughs> but you could, because I actually do think it tastes pretty good. <laughs> you just have to like, you know, make it prettier. So that's about it. You just, um, you do it until you fit in as much vegetables as you can. You can also shred in carrots. I think it's good to try to put in, I try to put it, I try to have at least um, two different vegetables in all my meals. Um, my kids love roasted cauliflower, and I'll be downloading that in the vegetable. I feel like I'm already doing my vegetable <laughs> talk. But I think that's one thing people, people think paleo folks only eat meat. And I think initially maybe when you go paleo, that is what you eat because it's been so long. And especially with bacon, like you overdose on bacon. Um, but then now I don't use bacon that often. Um, and today I'm not gonna cook with bacon at all, and it'll still be good. <laughs> well, it's not kosher, <laughs> oh, yeah. but I think I think bacon is a is a is a really great flavor booster, um, and so you don't need a lot. I think this is good. I'm gonna just. I need a little more salt. <laughs> so that's it, and then. So I think, no, I think that's good. I don't need more salt. So I think that, you know, it, this tastes good as is, but I think squeezing on some fresh lime juice at the end really does make a difference. And then normally if you're feeling fancy, you can add um, like herbs, like cilantro, if you like cilantro, is really, really good on this. Um, and it's surprising, like sometimes like, I don't want to take the extra step to you know, sliced up herbs. But then when you taste it, you're like, wow, it really does brighten the flavors. Um, and you can add green onion. And that's it. Ta-da. And this, I mean, depending on how many people you're feeding, 
could be a ton, right? Or if you are a, on a math game, then maybe it's one male. <laughs> but um, this in the fridge, like this is perfect in a frittata. And so you can, you can um, if you have leftover meat, you just stir fry it in a pan, crack in some eggs, and throw in some frozen vegetables, and you have a delicious frittata. And then you've stretched it even more, because you don't actually need a lot of leftovers for that. Okay. So on the kai thing that you have on the... So kai is a Thai omelet. You know, I don't know that this would be delicious, but I know like a traditional kai... Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> then, then I believe you. Because um, <laughs> when I was in Thailand, they do do pork um, and shrimp. Um, and yeah, you can do many, many things. And it actually makes me sad when people say they can't have eggs, because that is one of my favorite mm -hmm. emergency proteins. Can I see this here? Oh, cool. Um, but can all of you guys eat eggs? I know someone doesn't like eggs, even though she throws, she raises her own eggs. Yeah. But I think eggs are super easy desperation dinner. You can make crispy fried eggs, you can make scrambled eggs in like two seconds, right? So you have protein. And then if you have salad greens, you can make like a, like you can have eggs and salad. I have a sunny side salad on my site, which basically is just um, salad with crispy eggs. And then you put on some balsamic, and you can, you know, crack the yolk, and that makes a really nice dressing. Um, if you have hard boiled eggs in your fridge, you always have instant protein. I also stock up on um, canned fish a lot. I know that people are like, ew, canned fish, but canned fish is super, super nutritious. And you can doctor up your canned fish in many ways, like with the mayo I'm making. Um, and it also is a good, like when I used to work nights, like I would pack myself dinner and then I would bring snacks. Like sometimes I'd bring myself like some dark chocolate or something like, you know, not super healthy. And I would eat all those snacks. <coughs> and then I realized if I pack myself a little can of fish as my snack, I wouldn't always eat it because I wasn't always hungry enough to eat it. And I was like, oh, see, so this is the perfect emergency food, right? So I know it's healthy, but I won't really eat it until I'm hungry. Um, whereas if I have something else, like, you know, really yummy that I like, that I'm just packing as a snack, like, I'll just gobble that up. Um, so I think, I, for all of you, you guys should all store a can of fish at work. Um, you probably shouldn't crack it open at work, like when I used to do it at the hospital and I was really hungry. I actually would go to the stairwell and I crack it open and I eat it and then I'd put it in a Ziploc bag and throw it in the garbage. Is there a particular brand that is, just doesn't have a ton of preservatives? In yeah, it? yes, there are lots yeah, of good really? brands, yes. Okay. Um, I think depending on what type of fish you're looking for, yeah. um, I mean, Safe Catch is a good brand because um, I think their tuna has like super low mercury and it's all clearly labeled and they have no BPA in the lining. Um, Vital Choice online has really, really great sourced um, canned fish. Like they have, um, it's not super cheap. Like they have tuna belly and salmon belly. Um, it's called Ventresca for the tuna and Red Tresca for the salmon belly and it's in olive oil. And that is actually really, really good. Like I will just eat that right out of the can. Um, sardines are good too. Huh? Sardines. Yes, sardines are, sardines are better than tuna and salmon actually because they're super sustainable, you get the bones, like you should be eating the whole fish anyway. Um, and so, yeah, I know it sounds weird, but if you cover it with mayo, it tastes pretty good. The, the sardines that I find always have like a ton of, the, the ingredient list is like really long. It shouldn't have, there's, um, I'm trying to think the other brand I like a lot. There's another brand, Wild Planet is a good brand. Um, that you can get at Costco. And I think they're non-BPA, they make sure that there's, um, you know, not a bunch of, um, you know, heavy metals and all that bad stuff. Um, and, you know, the sardines are lower on the food chain, so it's, you know, it's not going to be, it's naturally not going to have as many metals. So I like Wild Planet, I think Safe Catch is good, and then the Vital Choice ones are good. There's also some other ones at Whole Foods that I've seen that, um, I'm trying to think of the brands, but they're, they should be clearly labeled because I know that, a lot of people um, are really concerned about all of these things, and they, the ingredients should just be the fish, 
water or oil, and maybe salt. So speaking of fish, mm -hmm. I have a, when, after making a salmon stir fry, I mm -hmm. find myself trying to pick out the bones. Should I just be eating those? <laughs> you can. Like, are you using fresh salmon? Uh, yeah, it is fresh salmon. It's just little, tiny, oh. sort of well, stringy bones. Hmm. I mean, I think it, <laughs> the difference I think with canned bones, like canned fish bones, is those are really powdery. Okay. And so you can totally eat those really easily, but I don't want to advise you to eat the bones in your salmon. I mean, it's probably good for you, but if you choke or it like it's pokes a hole in your esophagus, <laughs> like it's not a... I don't know. I, yeah, I, I don't. Yeah. Um, is there any way to pick them out then? Or you just yeah, with needle those pliers? Actually, yeah. you just hold the salmon down, like with your hand, like the fillet. You take needle those pliers. Tweezers, I find, don't work too yeah. well, but needle those pliers and you just pull. Okay, so yeah. you just hold the salmon that is still whole? Yeah. 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 So I don't actually do a lot of salmon stir fries because I feel like it overcooks really easily. I do try to just cook it whole as a filet. And when it's whole as a filet, it's much easier to, as you're eating it, to take out the, the bones. And if you do the sardines that are packed in oil, mm -hmm.
shrimp is always a really easy one because, uh, but you have to worry about the sourcing for shrimp. I mean, that's the whole problem. I mean, we can do a whole talk on seafood. The seafood, <laughs> seafood is really nutrient dense and it is a, you know, it's a great protein. A lot of people said, you know, that besides insects is a great way to feed the world. Um, and there, like a lot of times people said, like farmed is terrible because depending on, you know, what they're feeding the farm fish. But um, there are newer ways of farming that are supposed to be good and they're feeding the fish like algae. And so then that actually, you know, makes it have a good fatty acid profile that's like more normal to what a fish would have. Um, but I think I always go to the Monterey Bay um, Seafood Watch to kind of figure out what I should be ordering and buying. Um, National Geographic also has a great one on um, you know the types of fish to buy that are like low in uh, pollutants and sustainable. Um, but it is hard to actually find a vendor that treats fish the right way. Um, so luckily where I live in the Bay Area, there's a woman who's super, super passionate about finding sustainable local fish. Oh, I'll, I'll call you in one second. Okay. And, um, and so I know when I buy from her that she's already done all the research. I don't have to worry about it. And it's called Siren, Se uh, Siren Fish Company. And I think she's now shipping it um, across the state. But fish, seafood is expensive. Um, you know, there's no... There's no going around that fact. But that's why canned fish is, I think, a great option. It's portable. You can cover it up with mayonnaise, which I'll do right now because I know that I'm talking, talking, talking. But I will answer your question while I'm making the mail. Okay. So I was just wondering if that was 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Yes. 140 Fahrenheit. Um, and you want to, and my favorite, I know because you guys are nerds, my favorite meat thermometer is the Thermapen by Thermaworks. And it's not cheap, it's like a hundred bucks. But it will ensure that all of your meat is properly cooked all the time. So this is something you should ask, like when people say, oh, what do you want for your birthday? Hey, get me a thermopan, right? I mean, so you don't have to buy yourself. But I think like overcooking, especially if you're spending money on high quality protein, you don't want to overcook it. And like people say, oh, you can like make a fist and you can press here and this is medium rare and this is well done. You need a meat thermometer because that'll tell you exactly if you are cooking it to the right temperature. And that's why I used to like sous vide cooking when I was like super busy because you would cook to the exact temperature. Like if you like medium rare steaks, you can cook a whole bunch of steaks to like 125 and you know that it's perfectly medium rare. And then you can sear them off, you can keep them in the freezer. So I know a lot of people don't like sous vide, like a lot of my readers don't like it, so I don't do it as often. But that's another thing. If you are into cool gadgets and toys, they're not super expensive these days. Um, I have an older one that's like a water oven, but the newer immersion circulators are like, I think $129, and they work really, really well. Um, and I heard Anova makes a really good one. That's like a good one. So this is how I make mayo. Uh, normally, I like to use a cup that, that comes with your blender. So it should be nice and narrow and tall, or you can use a mason jar um, that's wide mouth so that it can actually fit through. Um, and this should work, hopefully. So you just put in, oh, my time. No, 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 oh. You're, you've got plenty of time. Okay. Um, when would you like to do this? Oh, uh, when are, I don't know. Okay, yeah. why don't just go ahead and start? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, I put in one egg yolk, and it doesn't have to be a large egg yolk. Um, in my Periscope demo, I only actually had small eggs, and that egg yolk had enough, um, you know, phospholipids and everything to help emulsify a cup of oil. And so what you're making with mayo, and a lot of people are always like, you know, my mayo didn't turn out, um, and it's because you're making an emulsion and you're trying to mix things that don't naturally go together. Like you're trying to mix oil and water. And so like if you hand whisk it, you really do have to trickle in the oil really, really slowly. And you have to be, you know, fast in whipping, you know, with your whisk. And so you can do it. I have a video that shows you can do it um, the old fashioned way. But it's much easier if someone is helping you 
And if someone is using like a squeeze bottle for the oil, so that's actually a lot of work. Um, and this method I learned from watching a video that J. Kenji lopez Alt, who's probably one of my food heroes, he has a new book out that is really, really cool if you're a food nerd, called The Food Lab, because he methodically tests, it's not paleo, but he will, he will, he tests his recipes like a million times, um, so you know the right way to cook things, and then you can modify it to, to be paleo. So I've got my egg yolk in here. So I think this is lemon juice, so this should be like a tablespoon of lemon juice, and a tablespoon of water. And so the lemon juice and the water are your water ingredients, and then you put in a cup of oil, and then I normally season with salt at the end. Oh, and you also have to put in like a teaspoon of um, mustard. And so the mustard and the phospholipids in the egg yolk are what help emulsify the oil and the water. Is it, I didn't see, is it dry mustard or is it? It's, it's Dijon mustard. Dijon mustard. Okay. So this is a cup. So I think this is olive oil, but I like avocado oil. I like macadamia nut oil. The problems with macadamia nut oil is that it's really expensive and it can be rancid a lot, depending on where you buy it, because sometimes it's on the shelf for a long time. Um, but avocado oil, I think, works really well. It might make your mayo a little bit green, um, but that's okay. And olive oil, I think, also works, but some people think that it's uh, just flavor's too strong, so like my friend Melissa Julewan recommends a light-flavored um, olive oil. But a lot of people traditionally make aioli with olive oil, so I don't know why people are complaining about the flavor. I actually think it tastes pretty good. So you just dump it all into your container. Hopefully this will work, because you need the bottom of the um, blade to immediately start mixing the yolk, and that works when you have a narrow container. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna see how this works. If it doesn't work, I'm just gonna blame it on the equipment. <laughs> but it does, it does work. Um, and Oh, yeah, see, oh, and if you look right away, look, look, there's white. So what I do is I kind of pull, and I, um, I angle it so that um, the oil at the top kind of gets funneled down. Yay! And sometimes people, um, people make the mistake of just, um, Blending, 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 blending until it breaks. And it will eventually break. So as soon as like it's done, it's done. Oh, so I'm almost done. I see a little bit of oil on the top. I'm gonna add a little bit of salt. Um, people talk about it breaking. What actually is breaking? Like what happens? Breaking is when the oil and water separate. Okay. So that's like so you're making an emulsion and you're hoping that the phospholipids and um, you know, the mustard will keep it emulsified because those, because um, phospholipids have like the positive and negative that will hopefully um, keep them together. But you know, naturally, oil and water don't want to. Ta da! Yeah, in like two seconds. Um, see, and so I'm, I'm actually just, I shouldn't be blending more. The olive oil is a little strong, <laughs> but you guys can try it. I know people are like, oh, no eggs. I think as long as your eggs are, um, I, I think you don't have to worry about it. But that, again, it also depends on your handling, um, how you're handling when you're cooking. Like people are like, well, how long exactly does fresh mayo last? Um, you know, some people say it's like the expiration date on the egg carton, and I actually, don't agree. I think that um, it depends on how dirty your container is and how dirty your mixer is and whether you spit in the bowl. I mean, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, but I think reasonably, like if you're using good eggs, if things are clean, it'll probably be good in your fridge for about a week. Um, I think Michael Woolman 
when he was asked this question, how long does male last? And like, when it doesn't, you know, when it doesn't taste good anymore, then you know that it's too good. Do you know there's an issue with really fresh eggs? No, those actually okay. work really, really well. If they're hard to boil. Yes, yeah, because the skin does swell. Yeah. But if you steam them, have you tried steaming yeah. your high gold eggs? Yeah, that's. I have high gold eggs. Yeah, yeah. No, it should be like awesomely okay. 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 Awesome. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that's done. You steam them before you boil them, or you no, steam you them? No, you just steam them. Before. You steam them as your oh, it's like that. <laughs> so you steam them as your way of like boiling them. Oh. And again, um, oh, and another way that um, J. Ken Lopez all said to boil them is to put cold eggs in like boiling, boiling water. So instead of like. Nope, he says, and the shells come off. I actually haven't tried that, but I know the steaming works really well. The only issue with the, the steaming... Other one works well too. Oh, the, just putting it yeah. in the boiling water? Yeah, down on the number eight. Oh, cool. So, um, but steaming sometimes can make the, I think, the whites too rubbery. And then you can also pressure cook them is another way to do it. Um, and so I think that is that. Oh, and so I used this mayo to make um, my Madras chicken salad. And so another way, so people are like, oh, my mayo is always breaking or separating. Um, if you refrigerate it, it will naturally be a little more stable because you're you're making a fat cold. Um, but it still can separate. Um, I use the whole egg, like the white and yeah, the white. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so the weight, I think you can. I think in a blender you can do because um, you need the because the white also adds more water. And so especially if you're using it in a Vitamix or something high powered, you have to add more water um, because it's so powerful that it's going to emulsify too quickly. Um, and you need more of the water to balance have it. Have you ever tried with duck eggs? I bet, I bet they would work really well. Um, I, would, I bet one duck egg yolk can emulsify two cups. So you could probably even make like a bunch. Yeah. No, I bet, I bet it would really work. And so here, look, there's mayo, and it's nice and emulsified. And I guess this is what I'm going to make. Um, and so this is how I make a madras chicken salad. Oh, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to cut this apple. <laughs> um, Thrive Market also has avocado oil. See, people from Periscope are giving advice. I buy my avocado oil from Costco. Yes, that is where you should buy it. And I think with avocado oil, you don't necessarily have to get organic um, because it's one of the clean 15 vegetables. And Does avocado oil taste like avocados? trying to help me fix my uh, my broken thing. I knew that would happen. <laughs> Sorry. So anyway, yeah, if someone says laugh out loud real life, so this is what happens. <laughs> Speaking of which, guys, keep your points so we got more food coming. So, um... Oh, it's coming. <laughs> oh, look. Ollie says hello. Hello. So I'm going to see, see, we're going to see if this nerd can help me fix it. Actually, I think, so. I think I know how this works. Well, he's a wizard, so. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's true. I'm a master builder, okay? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, look, he's going to help me fix this thing that Henry. I hope so. This is Lauren, everybody. Hello, Hi. Periscope. Hi. Oh. You got to break it. I know. I made him nervous. This nerd unites. Oh, and thank you for the hearts. I really just want the front row seat. Yeah. The, the <laughs> now, I will give you a doll afterwards for your help. All right. <laughs> Hello, world. There's <laughs> <laughs> only like 60 people. There aren't that many people. Oh, hello, people very small world. Oh. Hello, and Ollie and Henry. Right. Um, I'll put a pin in your pocket. No. Chicken salad takes advantage of um, the madras powder.
water that you already have stocked because you've made the garbage stir fry, and the mayo that you already made and is in your fridge. You can do it, Lauren. I know you can. I don't know if I can. Yes, you can. <laughs> you can't believe it. Like, it sounds so crazy. I think, I think it was on the side. So, oh, so you know, I think as a nerd, I'm, yeah, see? Oh. No, this is like this, I think. And then this. Legos with Michelle. I know, I'm sorry. This definitely goes here. So one, he made it so that it went around. Yeah. But it's okay, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Okay, so I have, so I almost always have chicken in my fridge. And you can easily get like a roast chicken at a grocery store on your way home from work. Um, and you know, I found out from the people at Whole Foods, like I think a lot of people always get the natural whole chicken because it, but the natural I think doesn't even have salt, right? So it doesn't taste fantastic. But they were saying that, um, I think by law they have to say there might be contaminants because the barbecue sauce or the barbecue one or one of the other ones has like gluten or something. But they say they always make sure to put those ones on the bottom and the ones up on top, like the lemon pepper or I don't know what else their other flavors are, are on the top so that it won't drip on them. So that's actually a thing to, to know. So I just take chicken because I always have leftover chicken. Another thing is if you roast chicken, you should roast two chickens, right? So you can eat one and then save one for whatever you make. Um, Mr. Chicken. You know, people always tell me about that because I know that like for my Kahlua pork recipe, they're like, oh, just throw in the KitchenAid and you put in the paddle and it'll like shred it. And I was like, but then I have to wash that. Like, so I think. I, I guess so, but I, I, I feel like, but if you put them in your dishwasher, you don't have room for all your other plates. That's true. So I, I think that's a good idea. That is true. That is true. But you can also just use like your oh, two forks. I, I just use my hand mixer. Like if I have yeah, that's what people are saying. Hand mixer oh, a hand mixer. Yeah. If it, if I use like bowls, chicken, yeah. I don't want to deal with it. I guess yeah. So. You can also do that. Um, oh, wow, look. They made some mayo for me already. And this one is like really emulsified. So this is really good. Um, I might use that. Um, oh, and then in terms of the apple, I'm going to just chop up the apple. Um, How much did you use that? Sorry. I'm assuming, so for myself, if I were making it, I would do. <coughs> I would probably do like six ounces for myself, six to eight ounces. Um, I think, oh, see, there was a piece missing. I think this is this is like a serving. I don't know exactly how much, but I'm trying to think like, if I were making my own salad at home, that's about. Um, and you can take the skin off, but you know, the skin is good fiber to feed, feed your healthy gut bacteria. That's actually something that I've just been reading about. Um, there's a new book I'm reading called The Good Gut, and I think it's really fascinating because I think one part that um, a lot of people weren't talking about with like Paleo 1.0 is making sure you have a healthy microbiome. And so I think a lot of people went super low carb or they didn't eat a lot of um, fibrous foods, and that is important to maintain your oh, good yeah. gut for us. Yay! Woo! Woo! Sorry, Lauren, I knew you could do it. <laughs> I think it's mostly put together. So the way I cut my uh, the way I cut my apple is I just cut around the corner. Um, so everything's stuck inside, and then I eat around it. Um, nope. Oh no! Yeah. At least I know what I'm doing. No, I'm happy. I really? I I. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> I believe in you, Lauren. Thanks. I believe in you too. Nerds are a tough crowd. <laughs> right? right.
So in terms of apple, you don't have to overpower it. I, I like the crunch and the sweetness that a little apple adds. Um, but I know some people are like, oh, I hate fruit in my salads. But I think this is actually good. It's like, you add a little bit of the apple. Oh, here, I can be right next to you. Um, and then in terms of seasoning, you, oh, I can make a flavored mayo in one of these. I'll make it in the chicken. really about exact measurements because you just have to make sure there's enough and some people like really creamy salads and people think that you know they don't want it super creamy then you add some curry powder hmm is there a lemon oh right here I knew that of course you got your lemon <laughs> we try so you just add the curry powder, and then um, I'm gonna just mix that in. Well, this may not oh. be your husband's design, but this should work. Yay! I have an extra piece. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how is there an extra piece? I don't know. Maybe this is better. Okay, let's see. Let's try this back here. apples from browning isn't so much the um, citric acid you can put it in slightly salted water for 10 minutes there's a serious heat article on this it is so you so you take a cup of water half a teaspoon of kosher salt um, and then you dunk your apple slices in there for 10 minutes and then you can rinse off your apple slices afterwards and like it's not salty at all because I tested it with my children and they will stay white um, or whatever color apples are, um, for several hours. Wow. Yeah. Half a teaspoon of kosher salt to one cup of water. Do you think that would work with avocados? You know, the way to do avocados is, um, <coughs> oh, it's guacamole. Um, there's a lot of different ways for avocados. And, um, so I've had it where if you have half a cut avocado and you leave the seed in, if you put, I think if you put sliced onions in in, in it in a um, in a Tupperware, it won't brown. And so I actually tried that once. Um, I actually even bought some lame contraption where <laughs> it like it was like made for avocados and it was like flat up against the surface. I know for guacamole, if you add water on the top, it will um, keep it from browning. You just pour it off. And then you just stir it, and it totally works. Um, huh? Or you eat it right back. Yes, that is. One of my friends calls um, calls uh, avocados uh, nature's mayonnaise. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna steal that. So this, I'm just putting some chives. If you have chives, green onions also work as well. I like cilantro. I know some people are genetically predisposed to have it taste like soap, which. Uh, is unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, like for some people, some people like they're like, I hate cilantro. It tastes soapy, and it's because genetically they that's how it tastes to them, which sucks. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what's funny is I used to hate I used to hate cilantro as a kid, and now I really like it. So I hear that it's cilantro. Because it kills everything. So I had a word of warning. Like, I'm able to test that myself because I'm not a cilantro person. Yeah, it's sad. You can't have, like, you probably don't like salsa. There's a lot of things. All right. So then I'm going to put some. Huh? It just can be overpowering. Yeah. I'm one of those people who feel so good. As long as the proportions are right and it tastes great. How much of it is? All right, so I just added the lemon juice to it because I think acid really does fix things. 
and then that's it. Um, you just mix it all together. You can put it on a giant bed of greens. I hope you guys aren't grossed out if I try things. I won't touch more than what I'm eating. I'm gonna add more apples. But I think apple, do not skip out on the apple. The apple actually does make it taste better. Ta-da, there you go. Look, hello, people. I might have missed it, but what kind of apple did you use? This looks like a red delicious or something. But normally at home, my kids, it's whatever I have in my crisper. And my kids like Fuji and Honeycrisp. So that is what I... Those are delicious or apples. And that's it. I think... I think those are, oh no, see I knew there was something I'm missing. So I like to put toasted almonds on the top because it does make it taste better. So these are all things, so even though it's super simple, there are things that you can add to punch it up. So like the apples really make a difference, the cilantro and the chives, the madras curry powder, like so those are things to kind of just make it a fancier salad and then toasted almonds, give it crunch, and that's it. And you can also put like, you know, dried cranberries. So there's a lot of different ways that you can make this fancier. And then I think on Facebook today, I put up an old recipe of mine for like my almond chicken salad and it shows you how to make kind of like a Thai inspired, um, you know, nut butter sauce. Um, but that is about it. Ta-da! Thank you people, I'm going to shut this off.